uh, verses 1 to 17. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children out, of, out in the temple, crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that you've given us your word not just in these scriptures, but you have given us your word most fully in your Son. Would you help us as we come to consider him, to consider what he has done, to consider what he has said, uh, to have understanding, to have humility, and to have faith, uh, to receive these words and know that they are gifts from you. They are words of life. They are words of light even in the midst of our darkness. Help us to receive them this morning. Open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts. Uh, May your word become like a seed, entering our hearts, our lives, and producing good fruit that glorifies you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this past Thursday was opening day for Major League Baseball. And in 1970, on opening day, the game of baseball changed. And it was not a change to the rules of baseball, like the pitch clock this year. It was a change to the sound of the game. Nancy Faust, who is the organist for the Chicago White Sox, began to play the home state song of every player as they came up to bat. And that began the tradition of what is called the walk-up song. And now players, it's usually not the organ anymore. Now players choose a recorded piece of music that gets the crowd excited or that motivates the player or that expresses something unique about the player. Palm Sunday is a walk-up song. Jesus is in many ways stepping up to the plate He is initiating the climactic accomplishments of his mission. He is provoking a final and ultimate, a definitive conflict, not only with the religious and political leaders of his day, but with the principalities and the powers, with sin, Satan, and death. Jesus is stepping up to the plate. And what happens around that, 
What happens on Palm Sunday isn't just to get the crowd excited. It's not to motivate Jesus, but it does express something unique about him. The sights and sounds of Palm Sunday show us who Jesus is, what he is doing, and why it matters. And why it matters for us today. And so this morning, I want us to listen to this walk up music that we find in Matthew chapter 21. And we'll hear that it sings to us of a problem and of a solution. So, first of all, the problem. The crowds at the gate. And the kids in the temple both sing a song, and it's a song from the Old Testament. It is a song taken from Psalm 118. And what's the first word of this song? Hosanna. Well, that word is not only a, an expression of celebration, that word is also a cry for help. The word means save us. It means we have a problem and we need help. Why? Why is the first word of this song on Palm Sunday a cry for help? Well, the answer to that is where? Where are we as these pilgrims sing this song? Well, we are at the city of Jerusalem. These pilgrims are making their way to the city for the celebration of Passover. And that's the problem. The problem is that this city was supposed to be a city of peace. It's in the name. That's what the name Jerusalem means, the city of peace. And this peace wasn't just some vague notion of positive feeling. This peace was the vision of God himself. It was the vision of God himself expressed beautifully in prophets like Isaiah, who imagines the wolf befriending the lamb, a child playing with a cobra. And God says through Isaiah in that passage that they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain. What's his holy mountain? It's the city of Jerusalem. But as these pilgrims make their way into the supposed city of peace, they understand and they know that this city was not living up to its name. It was not a manifestation of God's peace. In fact, it was under the thumb of Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, a very different vision than the one we read about in Isaiah chapter 11. And not only was it under the oppression of a foreign army, it was also riven by divisions, riven by violent differences and clashes between competing Jewish groups vying for power and influence. That's why these pilgrims, as they make their way into this city, cry out, Hosanna, save us, help us. And notice how Jesus responds to this cry. Where does he go after he enters the city? He doesn't go to the Roman garrison and attack the Roman army. He doesn't go to City Hall and register a new political party. No, he goes to the temple, and he interrupts the flow of commerce there. Why? Because that was the heart of the problem. Because that was the reason why Jerusalem wasn't living up to its name. It was not a lack of military strength. It was not a lack of political strategy. It was a failure of worship. What was supposed to be access to the presence of God was becoming more of a barrier to the presence of God. 
What was supposed to draw the attention and the love of the people towards the transcendent beauty and power of God was now drawing their love, their attention to another God, to the God of mammon, to the love of money. Jesus is here, as the prophets and kings of the Old Testament do, to destroy idolatry. He is breaking down their attachment to the God of mammon. And as Jesus does that, what he does at the temple is he says to the people, okay, you're crying out, save us. You're crying out, help us. He is saying, this is what you need help with. This is what you need saving from. And that was not only a historical truth for that day, it is a human truth for this day. Because the possibility of Jerusalem, the possibility of a city of peace, wasn't just for one ethnic group of people. It was the hope of the world. Isaiah said that the nations would gather to this dream, would gather to this city, and as they did, their swords would become plowshares. The instruments of war, violence, and death would become tools of farming, fruitfulness, and life. Don't you long for that? I read this week that Broadway is once again reviving the musical Camelot. And my first thought was, why? (laughs) Why do we need to do that one again? And the article said, well, the songs are classics, they're great, and Aaron Sorkin is rewriting the script, updating and modernizing the script, but I wonder if there's a deeper reason. I wonder if we keep coming back to Camelot because we long for a beautiful, shining city that expresses the best, the highest, of what we can be. And I also wonder if we intuit that there's a betrayal at the heart of Camelot that is the reason why that city cannot last and why the dream becomes a nightmare. That's the story of Jerusalem. And Jesus entered that city to affirm the dream. He is saying, yes, you should long for that shining, beautiful city. You should long for a place where children are not shot at school and their parents do not have to grieve with unimaginable grief. You should want that. But Jesus goes to the temple to reveal the heart of the nightmare. And he says, we do not have that. We do not know that peace because we have turned from the God of that peace. And we have given our loves to other things and other people. We have given our love to mammon and to other gods, to competitive allegiances. That's what's at the heart of the nightmare. And what that should produce in us is not naivete about the reality of evil. And it's not cynicism about the possibility of good. What that should produce in us is a desire to join the choir, to join the choir of people saying, Hosanna, save us, help us. 
But that is not only a cry for help, that is also a shout of celebration. Hosanna is said with the expectation, with the joyful expectation that help is available. And so we need to hear not only the problem, but the solution. Verses 4 and 5 connect this parade into Jerusalem to the poetry of another prophet, a prophet named Zechariah. And Zechariah, like Isaiah, imagines Jerusalem living up to its name. Zechariah, along with Isaiah and a host of other prophets, imagines the possibility of this city. And he says that one day Jerusalem will rejoice. Why? What causes that possibility to happen? What causes that rejoicing? Well, a king riding on a donkey. You don't have Camelot without Arthur. A king riding on a donkey, humble, riding into the city. And though this king is humble, the donkey isn't primarily about humility. Plenty of monarchs in the Old Testament rode donkeys. No, think about the difference. In this culture, what's the difference between a horse and a donkey? Well, the horse is an animal of war. The donkey is an animal of peace. It's a beast of burden. It's a farming animal. It is swords becoming plowshares. And Zechariah goes on to say in that passage that Matthew quotes from, that as this king rides into the city, he will banish the war horses. He will banish the chariots, and he will speak peace, not just to that city, but to all nations. And I love that Matthew includes for us a detail that the other Gospels don't include. And it's the fact that Jesus rides into Jerusalem, not just with one donkey, but with two. Why? Well, it's a mother and her foal. A mother and her baby. War separates mothers from their children. Peace doesn't. Jesus is riding into this city on the vision of what he will accomplish. He is showing, he is saying, I am the royal solution. I am the king who will announce peace to the nations who will banish the war horses and the chariots who will restore children to their mothers. And how does he do that? How does Jesus fulfill this royal role? How does he accomplish this peace? Well, again, he doesn't just enter the city of Jerusalem, where does he go next? He goes not to the Roman garrison, he goes not to City Hall, but he goes to the temple. And Jesus doesn't only remove the vendors from the temple. We get stuck there, we get excited about Jesus kicking over tables, and we stay there. But that's not the end of what Jesus does. He removes the vendors and then he occupies the space. He occupies the temple, not only as the king, but as the priest and as the presence of God. And the blind and the lame come to him. And for ritual and historical reasons, I don't have time to go into, the blind and the lame weren't allowed in the temple. But now that Jesus occupies the temple, the blind and the lame come to them, and he heals them, and he he welcomes the excluded. And then when the pastors get grumpy about the noise that the kids are making as they echo that parade song that they had heard earlier in the day, what does Jesus do? 
He doesn't silence them. He doesn't dismiss them. He goes to another psalm, and he looks at the leaders and says, don't you know? Don't you know that it's not the well-educated and the powerful, but it is the weak and the vulnerable who express true worship. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He is healing the heart of the problem. He is removing the barrier of access to the presence of God, and he is restoring true worship. And that's why he doesn't stay at the temple. That's why by the end of the week, he is outside of the city hanging on a cross. Because what he did on Palm Sunday merely anticipated what he would more fully do on Good Friday. As he hung there, dying, bearing the barrier, bearing our sin, and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he does that, What happens at the temple? The curtain rips wide open. See, Jesus entered Jerusalem so that he could open Jerusalem to us. So that he could remove the barrier and open to us the promise, the hope of God's Presence and peace. This next weekend, we will not only celebrate Easter, but the Masters Tournament will be played in Augusta, Georgia. And that always reminds me of the time when my dad drove my brother and myself around the area of Augusta, Georgia, and we drove by the entrance to Augusta National. And my dad said, hey, boys, look, that's where they play the Masters. Let's go see it. And he pulled into the driveway, and we immediately met a gate and were immediately surrounded what looked like presidential secret service agents, making it very clear that we were not welcome to see the place where they play the Masters. And then a number of years later, my brother moved to Scotland And I went to visit him, and we traveled to see the city of St. Andrews, which is the home of another famous golf course. But you know what I found out? The golf course in St. Andrews, with all of its history, with all of its prestige, is still a public course, and it is open to all. You can take a walking tour of that golf course. There are times when they open it to families to have picnics on the ground. Jesus entered Jerusalem in order to make God's peace for us, not Augusta National, but St. Andrews. He went to the temple in Jerusalem so that he could make of us a temple the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus went to the cross and he rose from the dead so that he could begin to work in us. To make of us, of our relationships, of our community, Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church, the beginnings of a new Jerusalem. That beautiful, shining city of peace. Do you realize that's what he's doing here and now? In a world that is sick with violence, resentment, anger, and rage, Jesus is now building us as an alternative city a city of forgiveness, reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy, and peace. 
And so on a week where we have been tragically reminded of the nightmare, we should grieve. We should grieve and long for the fullness of that city that is yet to come. But we should also worship. We should turn with faith and adoration to the king who is restoring the dream of a city of peace. And yes, he's not done yet, but he is at work doing it, that in our lives even now. And we should look up, look for that sign up list for the choir, for the choir that sings Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who has come and will come in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we long for the city of peace, and we don't yet fully see it. We experience in so many ways, not just in the news, but in our own homes, in our own hearts, chaos, anger, resentment, all of the fruits of our turning away from you. And so I ask this morning that you would restore our hope. I ask that you would help us to join the chorus, looking to Jesus, looking to the one who rode in the city, into the city with those donkeys, the one who went to the temple and the one who went to the cross. And Father, even in our grief, even in our fear, even in our disappointment, even in our temptation to despair, would you help us to lift up our voices and say, Hosanna, save us, help us, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I pray in Jesus' name.